Welcome everyone back to uh, episode 29 of the Smoking Snake podcast. Uh, super special guest today. Um, we are joined here uh, by a guy who's been tweeting about Corinthians in English since 2015. He's amassed thousands of followers on his account titled exactly that, Corinthians in English. He was one of my first followers on my Santos FC English account. His retweets, favorites, and interactions helped me a lot in the early days. Uh, and most importantly, he's fresh off completing a very intense public exam. A big welcome to uh, Fabian uh, of Corinthians in English. Uh, welcome to the Smoking Take Podcast. Hey, Peter. Hey, Enrique. Uh, thanks for having me here. Of course, of course. And of course, like Fabian just said, we are joined in by Enric as always. Um, and we're super excited to have you here, talk all things Corinthians. Um, but before we dive into uh, the the game of football and everything, just kind of tell us where you're from in Brazil and how you became interested in uh, both football and Corinthians. Um, and then what inspired you to make that Twitter account? Yeah, uh, I'm Brazilian and I was born in Sao Paulo. So becoming a Corinthian supporter was a, was always the most likely outcome, right? We're the majority around here. But um, I was raised by my mother and uh, she she's a Corinthian supporter. But when I look, look back, she really didn't influence me a lot. But um, when I when I when I go back and I think um, the way I thought when I was a child looking at football uh, and uh I really like Corinthians Crest. I always loved it, like the, the shapes, the colors, the, the it's so dope, right? The, the the whole thing in the chest, it goes, it goes hard. Yeah, I really thought it was so beautiful. And um, and when I look to the side and I look like São Paulo Crest and like what is that, right? Who who, who drew that? And uh, why why does it look like an underwear? And uh, <laughs> yeah, it uh, it was always Corinthians. Yeah, nice. the, the story about the, the Twitter account was that um, uh, I always thought that um, not, on, not only Corinthians, but uh, all the Brazilian clubs in general, they, they really do ne neglect the international audience, you know, the international fan base. Because, for instance, how, how did you guys become sent to supporters? It, well, for me, it was through um, my grandfather, uh, who was a fan of Pelé and had a book about sort of um the great sporting people of of um the 1900s and of course a big thing on Pelé was in the book and so I grew up reading this book all the time it was because it was a big picture book and so since a child I knew Pelé and I knew this club if not by name but this club that dressed all in white and you know when I got into football later in life after the world cup in 2006 um I, the only thing I really knew about the sport was Pelé and Santos or the club that dressed in all white. And so that's when I decided, you know, that, that, that was my club. Yep. And then for me, uh, the way how I became a Santos supporter goes back to 2010, 2011, where that's where the love for Brazil began for me. And somehow in June, 2011, I think, I uh, watched the uh, Brazil game against Netherland and that's where Neymar was playing. And that was the first time I actually saw him look at the haircut and thought, wow, that's such a cool haircut. And his play style was amazing, like with all the dribbles and skills. So that's where, how I first started and then kind of began watching his games for Santos playing live. Although it would be in a difficult time schedule for me. I used to live in Albania at that time. I still managed to try and watch the highlights or even go on YouTube later to watch Santos. Yeah, and that's the crazy thing, right? Like, um, football gets you in different ways, like a book or, or, or a game against Netherlands. And uh, it goes the same for everyone, like um, uh, a FIFA career, a football manager career. Like, um, if you make a friend that um, 
a foreign friend that uh, cheers for some club and you grow fond of it. And um, football is really international these days. Um, we can watch the games from pretty much every part of the world. And um, the fact that the Brazilian clubs still have trouble uh, talking to the audiences in other parts of the of the globe, uh, other than Brazil, it's, it's kind of baffling for me. And um, that's how I started, right? There was this um, this this need and um, just to talk to these people, right? To to reach these people. And um, if Corinthians doesn't do it, and I mean, the, I made the account in 2015. We're in we're in 2023. Like eight years have passed, and Corinthians and and the other clubs still haven't realized uh, this potential and. Um, the amount of people that, that want to know about our future, our football, to know, um, to have the content about our clubs, right? And um, so it, it went up from there. Yeah, that's cool to know. And just like you, so many people somehow find their club maybe at a very young age or maybe until they're like 18, 20. That's when they find the love for football. And so did you about Corinthians. And I wanted to ask you, Fabian, uh, what's it like to be a Corinthian supporter in the state of Sao Paulo, knowing there's hundreds of teams out there looking to face you and play against when it comes to big competitions? And do uh, opposite club supporters go along well with each other? Or is there some sort of hate even outside of the stadium? Yeah, um, I think there's a, there are a lot of um, local cultures of football in Brazil. And... Um, in Sao Paulo, I think, uh, like with most things, uh, Sao Paulo people take it really seriously, right? And um, there is some animosity between fans, uh, so much that um, the the games played here in the state of Sao Paulo, they um, when they have two rivals going against each other, is the, the stadium uh, will have just fans of one club. It won't be open to both clubs, which is a shame, but. Unfortunately, yeah, it is what it is, and um, yeah, it's um, as you said, um, when Corinthians plays and uh, as the majority club here, and um, all the players of the clubs are more motivated to face us, knowing that the the spotlight are on them, uh, knowing it's their chance to shine and their chance to you know make a big jump on their careers and things and. Uh, it's cool, but at the same time, it's uh, it's a little complicated, you know. It, uh, sometimes, so is the 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 worst guys scoring on us, and uh, it gets old. It gets really old. <laughs> well, we'll get to it a little bit later, but I think Enric and I are are tired of uh, Hunter Grad's uh, scoring on us, so we can sympathize. But uh, before we get to that, um, just curious on kind of the era that you grew up uh, watching Corinthians. Um, who was your favorite player in that time? I know, um, you know, so many great players have passed through and, and even the current crop of talent, it's pretty amazing. But you, you think you've got Socrates and Ronaldo and Adriano and Tavez and all these amazing players. Who was kind of your favorite player growing up? Yeah, I was born in 91. So uh, I was really fortunate to to grow up in a you know a time where um, when I was a child my team was working really well. So uh, when I turned on the TV and uh, the team were always trampling people, right? Uh, I mean, uh, from uh, we won the Brasileirão in '98, '99, and then we won the won the Club World Cup in 2000. So it was a magical squad. Um, Marcelinho, Edilson, Vampeta, Rincon, Luizão, Gida, all great, great guys. But I think uh, the childhood, childhood hero from every kid uh, that's around my age is Marcelinho, right? He was a magical, magical player. He, he was, he's one of the best free kick scorers in all time. Um, there wasn't a point in the field where he wouldn't try to shoot it and he would get in a lot of times, and um, that was a, a thing that really marked my childhood, right? Like buying his shirt, having the seven in my back, and um, he was the he was the guy. Nice, awesome, yeah. I mean, you, you you talk about just the various phases of success that Corinthians have had, um, 
And the, the history uh, is so intriguing uh, about the club. And, and there's a particular period that I think the club is probably very, I mean, it's famous around the world for, and it, it actually transcends the sport itself. Um, and it's a very, you know, integral part of the club. And, you know, one of the components of the stories of, um, you know, it's one of its most famous players, Socrates. So could you just tell us a little bit about kind of the phrase and the concept um, of uh, uh, Democracia Corinthiana um, and, and kind of how that that affected the, the culture in the 80s? Uh, Socrates and the whole Democracia Corinthiana team is one of the most beautiful episodes in, in sports, really, and probably of, of our team. Uh, we do have a story of uh, um, intertwining uh, sports and politics that goes way back to our foundation. And um, the club was created by the, the proletariat. Uh, it, was cre it, it was created by the people for the people. And, um, and then we, there is a game called the Red Game in 1945. That was um, Corinthians and Palmeiras. Um, we were just going out of the of a dictatorship. Parties were becoming legal again, and um, Corinthians and Palmeiras uh, they made us friendly, and all the revenue from the game went to finance the the Communist Party from the time. And um, and then when it when it goes to the eighties, um, there is another dictatorship, and um, when when Socrates and Casagrande and all the guys, they show up and and say that. Um, they they could um, administrate the club themselves, the 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 pitch, you know, like um, it shouldn't be any injuries between um, the administration and the club, like there was with the the, the country back then, like um, the military uh, run uh, almost everything, the everything was really centralized, and uh, soccer just really defied the logic by the time. Um, he incentivized voting. He he went against the the, the dictatorship was uh, political positions uh, all the time. And um, what is really nice about it is that even if um, Socrates uh, departed from Corinthians in in 1983, uh, even then um, he 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 ended up ended up dying in 2011. His legacy still lives on. Like um, the the date of the coup is still um, celebrated by the military here. It's on March 30, 31st. And um, recently we had um, a president that really um, highlighted this period of our history. Like it was a nice period. And uh, in, on this date, Corinthians went on and put the, we have a, a Socrates a statue in Neokimi Arena. And uh, they, they moved the statue to go on the, the balconies of the stadium and they flashed that banner with, uh, that said, uh, win your losing, um, win your losing, uh, win your losing, but always with democracy. So um, it's still like um, he has a legacy and his spirit is on uh, with the, the supporters and the club itself. Yeah, that's great to hear how much times changed from 1980s until now. And I think one of the things I remember from Socrates is, I don't know if it's true, but he said the day he dies, he would like to be a Sunday. And also he wants to see Corinthians as the champions of Brazil, which exactly happened in 2011. And a year later, uh, Corinthians also won the Copa Libertadores, a competition that Every team, not only in Brazil, but in South America, would fight to win. And ever since then, overall, uh, they haven't done really good. Uh, in that 2012 run, they beat Santos in the semifinal and won it. Uh, I'm, I keep forgetting who they played in the final, maybe Boca Juniors. I, I might be wrong. Yes. But uh, in 2013, uh, they lost to Boca Juniors in the round of 16. And... Those things kept happening in many, many years, getting knocked out in the round of 16. In a couple of years, 2014, 17, and 19, and also 21, they did not even participate. So I wanted to ask you your thoughts and opinion. What is going on with Corinthians in the continent? And do you think there are any chances for them to win Copa Libertadores this year? 
Yeah, uh, when we went up in 2008, we, we fell down, right? We were uh, relegated in 2007, and then we played the Serie B in 2008, and we won it. And uh, when we got Ronaldo, everything changed. Like, everything changed. Um, the the spirit in the club changed. Like, we were on a, an upward trajectory. And um, when we found Chichi, we probably, by that time, we were the greatest coach in, in club's history. Like, we really found the pieces together to make this happen, right? Um, as you said, we won the Brasileiro in 2011. That, that quote from Socrates is true. He said he wanted to die in a Sunday where Corinthians lifted a trophy, and he, he did, which is insane if you think about it. It really is a prophecy. And um, the, the team from 2011, we, we were able to keep most of the guys. And uh, Chichi, as the, the expert coach he is, um, he could um, extract the most from that team, you know. Like Corinthians had never won the Libertadores by that point. There was, there was really a, a trauma about that. Like uh, we were the laughing stock of the rivals up on that team specifically. Like uh, everyone said we didn't have Libertadores and things like that. And it's, it's true, we did not. And um, when Chicha arrived, he really had um, a hard time like um, preparing the guys like mentally, you know, to, to everyone being in the right spot and uh, to be with the right mindset. To be really focused and um, to um, cover the, the the noise from the outside and, and just go play and do their best, and they effectively did. You know, like um, the the run in two thousand twelve. Like uh, the guys in the podcast listening now, they won't see, but I'm holding a cup here that says two thousand twelve. Yeah, my 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 favorite year following the club, <laughs> and. Um, yeah, the, the the year was great, like right, like uh, uh we we won the Libertadores, which we never did, and we did so in a unbeaten way, right? Uh, we were um fourteen games, like uh, eight wins and six draws. Um, the only club to win uh, Libertadores in almost that many games was Flamengo in, in the last year, like uh, they were unbeaten too, and it's such a an amazing feet right like uh you spend so much time uh pursuing this trophy wanting it and when you do it no one can beat you and you do it in uh in an impeccable way right like it's it's really magical and then uh the pro we when uh we played the Libertadores in 2012 the the finals were in July right and the club world cup was in December so um there was a whole six months where you 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 get to hold that anxiety from the players and from the fans and from the media, and um and trying to keep everyone focused and um knowing that the Brasileirão means something even though it's not the Club World Cup and uh, you can use the 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 league as a preparation for the big game, and we did uh, the the club didn't really go well in the Brasileirão but. It was enough to get the guys ready for the Club World Cup, which we eventually ended up winning. Last South American club to win the World Cup, the Club World Cup. Yeah, absolutely, and that's that's exactly where I was going next with that. Um, I mean, do you remember where you were and how you celebrated that? Because, I mean, we just passed the ten year anniversary of that. Um, it was an achievement in that time period, but now when you've looked at sort of the disparity between the European clubs and the South American clubs, um, including Flamengo's humbling loss this year to uh, in the semifinal, um, you know, really the only game that has been a real contest you could think was Flamengo and, and Liverpool um, back in, in 2019. Um, you think of some of the other defeats, Grêmio and and even Santos in 2011 got spanked by Barca. Um, you know, do you, can you tell us a little bit about how uh, Corinthians fans look back on that? I mean, that's got to be a source of pride. And can you tell us also about kind of the celebrations that went on after? Yeah. Um, when we think about that year, um, 
Chichi was really good friends with Abel Braga, which is the which was the coach for Internacional on the last um, Club World Cup before 2012. Uh, they won against Barcelona. Um, they were good friends, and Chichi was was asking him about the the tournament. And uh, Abel said that the the worst game to play, uh, the secret to the tournament was the first game, which is um, against uh, a team from another part of the, of the globe. You know, it's not the, the European champion, and um, because there there was the Intercontinental Trophy before the, the Club World Cup before two thousand. And uh, the format was that the, the South American champion was always going to face the European champion. So that's the, the format that is imprinted in people's mind here. Even though the, uh, it's a challenge and, and, and a great opportunity to face another schools of football, you know, from another continent, from Africa, from Asia, from North America, um, people really want to know about the big game. And that that's... That's about everyone, right? That's the media, that's the players. They all want to, to face the European champion and win it. But at the same time, when you're focusing on the on the the final, the final premium uh, prize, um, you're not really focusing on the task ahead of you, right? So um, I think a lot of, of times when you're talking about, you know, Atletico falling to Haja, International falling to Mazengbi, um, all of the South American clubs, I'm not saying they're superior to the other sides, but at the same time, I think there's a lack of concentration and a, um, and a spirit that you're just, um, you're just there to be the European champion. And uh, when you realize it's too late, you, you can't face them. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of the, what's holding us back right now, you know, because financially the, the, the biggest clubs are going well and the, uh, there's a lot of pressure too because um, it's been ten years right now that uh, a Brazilian club or a South American club didn't win it. So the media here and the fans, we the for the last time we were uh, world champions in a uh, national team level was twenty years ago. So I think there's a bit of a, a problem with with uh, people wanting some some kind of uh, validation, you know, mm -hmm. international validation. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think teams from South America need to do a better job when it comes to important big matches like these. At least if you're not going to be able to win the competition, uh, try and go into the final despite whoever's going to you're going to be playing next, whether it's Barca, United, Real Madrid. So just be competitive and show what Brazilian football is all about. And shifting back to Corinthians, uh, it's a team that has a combination of both very young and also old players with old ones, including Fabio Santos, who's 37, Cassio, Gil, and Renato Augusto, and Junior Moraes, all 35. And then we go into Paulinho, 34, Juliano, 32, but also very young talents like Mateus Bidu, who's 23, Pedrinho, Duqueiroz, Adson. As you mentioned, Roger Gedz, uh, Yuri Alberto, and Pedro Enrique, who's 17. So with all this uh, age gap, uh, do you think this helps the team spirit or is it completely opposite when it comes to matches in the Brasileiro? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's interesting, this topic, because it affects the, the game dynamic, the, the team dynamics, right? Because uh, we have two different generations at, at stake here. But at the same time, from all we hear from the media, they um the the older guys are pretty receptive to the young guy, younger guys. They uh, they um offer advice and things like that and go along well. Um, but as you said, like the the big name players, most of them are are on the wrong side of thirty, right? Um, I think this is um this is something that's. That has to do with the 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 bet on a new league in Brazil, right? Because the, the clubs are now uh, in two polar, um, not polar opposites, but they are on two different groups. They are negotiating um, on how to to administrate a, a, a national league because there isn't such a thing right now. The 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 league is administrated by CDF, and um, I think 
Corinthians is anticipating that when the 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 league business when they they join together and they sell the rights, there's going to be a big influx of money in a in a first moment, and um, it will it will uh, inflationate the market. So if you um, if you don't uh, buy good players like good name players like Renato Augusto, like Julian, like Paulinho. If you if you don't bring this guy before this deal, then it will be harder to bring them um, after the deal gets gets done because um, it will really inflationate everything, uh, their, their wages and and um, the contracts and everything. So um, that's that's the reason why I think um, the current administration of Corinthians did bad on this model of bringing these guys that you know can 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 be a good foundation because um you will need them because they probably won't be a bit available later right yeah i mean it's such a fascinating subject there's all the um you know like you said negotiation going on now um, between the two blocks libra and lff um and you know it's it's it seems to be the future of brazilian football um, and we've seen that kind of in England with kind of the spiral and the inflation of both wages and transfer fees. Um, and there's all, it's almost like a separate, I mean, it is a separate market when you think about it. And, you know, a, a player has a price to go to England and a price to go anywhere else in Europe. Um, so it, 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 something similar, like you were saying, could happen in Brazil. And it, it's smart that Corinthians are, are, are bringing in these big name players now rather than, than later. Um, and they've been, you know, relatively successful. Um, I thought they were going to be a little more successful last year, but um, they still have a great team with big pieces that have big names and a bunch of young talent. Um, and a lot of these players we know, right? Like Enric mentioned Hanato Augusto and, and Fagner, of course, the, the legendary defender, Casio, the even more legendary keeper, um, you know, Hundred Gads, Yuri Alberto, uh, these big stars. Um, who I'm curious to hear who on the team do you think is underrated, or who is like a, a kind of under the radar player that you think maybe doesn't get the attention that he deserves? I guess Giuliano fits fits the the role. Like um, he he has a, a such a respectable career, right? Uh, He's been a good player ever since he came out in Brazilian football, like uh, 13 years ago, I guess. But um, the midfield is a bit too crowded in our squad. So um, he sometimes he gets to play ever since he, he came back. Uh, in fact, um, he doesn't get to play wherever he wants. Like he, he the midfield has to accommodate um, Renato Augusto. At the same time, they, they have to put someone to to run for him, right? Like uh, you can um, you can't just field a, a bunch of older guys and expect that they they won't be gassed out by midfield by by uh, half time. So um, you have to find this balance, and um, I think Giuliano is a great attacking midfielder. And um, uh, the way Corinthians plays, ever since he came back, he he doesn't get to play in that position, right? To be, be just behind the, the attackers. So uh, just because of that, of that, I think he's underrated. Uh, I really uh, that's the, the Renato Augusto factor too. The guy is absolutely magical. He does he does incredible things on the pitch, and uh, he kind of everything around he, around him goes a bit of opaque, you know. Like uh, it's hard to shine when there's there's a guy shine so much just just by your side, you know. But uh, I think I think Julian is that underrated guy in this club. Nice, yeah, I I agree, and I I remember I can't remember exactly when, but we talked about him, Henrik and I, uh, last year at some point. Um, scored scored uh, at least one pretty pretty uh, impressive goal. Um, so with that in mind, I mean Corinthians always they have the money, of course. You see them pay these big wages. Um, they've got the players. A lot of talent. Um, you know, I thought they were really going to be putting on a, a, a title challenge last year. They fell a little bit short, but they looked poised to 
to um, you know compete with Flamengo and, and Gallo and and uh, Palmeiras as well. Um, but I'm curious to know: Do you think uh, the squad one needs any improvement? Um, and then where that improvement would be, whether it's a forward, a defender, um, you know, what what do you think uh, Corinthians need to sign right now to uh, to be um, in the best place to compete for the league title and and other titles like Libertadores? As a fan, you really want to to hear the name of your club alongside Palmeiras and Flamengo, which are which are the the clubs to beat right now. Um, Corinthians is dealing with a bit of um, a problem on the debt, on the financial side of things. Uh, the club wastes too much money every year just by uh, paying financial expenses because the the debt exploded um, some three or four years ago. Um, the the administration in this uh, past um, ten years. Uh, Henrik asked me about it uh, back then, and I couldn't. I I forgot to answer this, but um. The club was really badly administrated in the, the past 10 years, you know, like um, the guys just um, rolling over the debt and uh, not really caring about the, the future and the sustainability of the model, right? We we even won some titles, but uh, at some time we we would want to, we would have to pay the bill, right? And uh, the, the time has come and we have to, to restructurate the whole thing uh but right now that's that's why the squad looks the way it looks right it's it's really thin it's really thin like um most players don't have um reposition i'm not saying just the uh, an equal side because that's impossible right uh, you you have the, the bench players who who will not match the, the quality of the starters but at the same time the the drop off is too big when uh, we have to fill the reserves it Ended up, uh, it ends up uh, looking like a, a whole different thing. So um, I think we really do need some signings, uh, mostly like um, thinking about the future of the left back because Fabio Santos is great, but um, he he will probably he will probably retire by the end of the year. Um, Udi Alberto probably needs a, a, a better reserve. Um, that's not a knock on, on Junior Moraes. He's um, he seems to be a good player, but he he really wasn't available since he came in, and um, that has a lot to do with his time in Ukraine. Like uh, when he was sheltered there, uh, when the war started, and um, he 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 even had a an allergic reaction, and um, people were um, the the medical staff thought it it was related to 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 the trauma of war and things like that, and. Uh, that's why I said it's it's not really a knock on him, right? That's the 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 kind of thing you don't anticipate happening and and things like that. But you really need someone to to be a a fit replacement for you, Albert, uh, on that end. Uh, at the same time, uh, Corinthians is is signing Christian Barleta from San Bernardo. He is a twenty one year old uh, right uh, winger. Um, he's he he's been compared to Roger Guedes on his style of play. São Bernardo is doing like a, a great campaign in Paulista. They're second only behind Palmeiras, and um, some of the the club success it has to do with him. Uh, he's doing a great job there, so we just signed him, and uh, I hope to see good things from him because the the right winger position is. Is a bit empty right now. Um, Romero, we we signed uh, him this past window to play to play in the red wing, but at the same time he's 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 not in a good form, and uh, we don't know if or when he he will get back to to good form. Yeah, I agree with you. And going back to what you said about uh, Corinthians needing to pay the bill, a friend of mine told me a couple of years ago that ever, ever since the stadium near Kimika Arena was built. In 2014, Corinthians hasn't really been able to pay it all the debt needed for the facility. So maybe that's one of the reasons why they could be suffering still today. But it could be other reasons like having not having the necessary players for the team and also the coach. 
And I wanted to go over uh, last year's coach, Vitor Pereira, who currently is at Flamengo. We all know how he's doing there and wanted to get your opinion of what you thought of him as a Corinthian supporter or what were your hopes uh, during this time? People listening right now don't know, but uh, when I heard Vitor Pereira's Peter, uh, name, there was a big smile on my face because uh, <laughs> it's great what is happening there. Uh, everyone knows by now, you know, the, the guy left the, the club thinking he, he was going to take care of his mother-in-law. He was sick and things like that. And he just like that, he signed with Flamengo and he played uh, in three tournaments. He he said he went there because he, he wanted to compete in championships. And well, he did compete, but he didn't want none of the three he competed in. So, uh, yeah, um, he left. Um, the the squad uh, has been really complaining lately about the, his methods, not his his sport methods like the training or things like that, but he, he uh, his treat with people, right? He that he wasn't really a good leader, and um, the things with, were too serious when he were there. The things were just the doing the work and go home thing kind of thing. And um, now we have Fernando Lazaro. Fernando is the son of club legend San Maria. San Maria is one of the the 10 players to, to most wear the, the Corinthians shirt in history. So just the absolute legend. legend. And um, Fernando Lazaro has been in the club for 20 years now. He played every part in the club he could. Like he, he, he did every job. He was the scout, he was the analyst, he was part of the training staff, and now he's the coach, right? Um, people can question the fact that he, he doesn't have the experience coaching the team, but, it, but at the same time, they, they can say that he, he didn't deserve to be there, right? He, he, he was there and he, he went one step at a time and just climbing the, his way through the club's ranks until the, he, he is where he is now. And... Um, just by being like uh, one of us and uh, a guy who worked so much in the club for so much time, we have faith in him. The 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 start wasn't perfect, but it couldn't be like um, we wouldn't want the the every every game in Paulista, right? Uh, I think he's doing an okay job, and um, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic about his future. I think he has a lot to grow and a lot to learn. And uh, once he does, and I hope it's quick, um, I think the team can can gel together and uh, achieve great things. Yeah, that's great. And hopefully the current coach, Fernando Lazaro, does a way better job than uh, Peter Pereira did last season and brings uh, such a legendary club like Corinthians back to glory. And I wanted to ask you your thoughts on Silvino. Uh, I believe he was one of their coaches or coaching assistants for Corinthians a couple of years ago. And he recently took over my national team, Albanian, and alongside Zabaleta, who is um, a Man City ex-player. Wanted to know what your thoughts were on Silvino or is does he have any percentage of winning any trophy in the future for the national team? First of all, love Albania. Uh, shout out to Dua Lipa and, um, <laughs> definitely shout out to her about, <laughs> <laughs> about Silvino um, he's a hard working guy he worked with um, some of the best athletes out there some of the best, best coaches out there um, at club level and a national level um, so I think the, the, the background and the, the tools are there you know like uh, he wasn't able to to do anything here really well. Like um, he, I th there was there was some problems with his tenure here, but um, I think the biggest one were the press conferences. Like um, the game went some way, and then he he went to the press conference and told a whole different story from a game that didn't happen. So. The, the the fans listening to the press conferences were thinking like um did he see this game or he is inventing it and you don't know what's worse right uh you don't know if uh if him um 
inventing a game that didn't happen to pull us. It's, it's best that he that him just misinterpreting misinterpreting the, the whole thing, right? The the whole um, lessons that a, a game can teach you, and uh, he wasn't he wasn't getting the message. And um, I think that was his problem here, his inability to to learn from his mistakes, and um, the 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 constant gas lighting on the pressers really got old, and um, the fans starting to to was um, they did start to want him out at some point because um, it wears you out, right? Like. Um, He's a really promising coach, and uh, he's a hardworking guy and a great guy. That's that's we, we can say this about him, you know. Like everyone who knows him, everyone who worked about him, he he's a good person, really is. And um, maybe the the routine and the his methods might work best at national level than at club level. And I really hope for him. He's a good guy. I I I really hope for him to be to have a good career. Nice. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, let's move on uh, just to um, a subject that I hope doesn't get too uh, hot under the collar. Obviously, Enric and I uh, are supporters and fans of the Club Santos, a great rivalry, uh, the black and white Clasico. Um, just curious, we just had the game. Um, I know you were super busy. Uh, that weekend, um, but we just had the match. Um, it was a 2-2 draw, um, but just curious uh, because on the flip side, I, of course, there's a, it's a very passionate rivalry, but you've also, I was looking back in our DMs, you you uh, you sent me a picture at, at, at Villa Belmiro at one point. Um, and uh, just curious how you think uh, basically Corinthians supporters view Santos as a club, Obviously, right now, historically, the clubs are very, you know, I guess, comparable when it comes to trophies. Right now, Santos is much further down in the table, and you kind of expect that to continue at least uh, for uh, this year, for sure. And you've seen that in Paulista already. I'm just curious how you and, and your fellow Corinthians supporters view Santos. I think. I think uh, Corinthians and Santos' history is undeniable. It's a big one. It has hundreds of games. And um, um, we really made a fool of, out of, uh, of each other in different points of time, right? Like uh, Santos at one point had like uh, 10 years without losing to Corinthians, which is kind of ridiculous. We, we, almost, um, we almost did it back to you guys like in the, in the 90s. It was, was, was a big drop. Uh, drought from Santos too, but um, I um, for Corinthians fans, like it has a lot to do with um, the club being in the capital, you know, being in São Paulo. So uh, Palmeiras is the is the biggest rival, is the oldest one, is the um, um, not the oldest. Santos is really the oldest, but uh, I think uh, having each other so close made the the, the rivalry with uh, Palmeiras and and São Paulo bigger than. It is with Santos, right? Uh, I know that uh, Santos view was at, as uh, their biggest rival, and um, they're always good games, you know. Like uh, I didn't have the opportunity to, to see the game on Sunday, but at the same time, I uh, I checked some some highlights and some stats, and um, it looked like a good game. It looked like a bit frustrating for us, like uh, considering to. Um, late equalizers and first and second half uh a bit for lack of attention but uh, it looked like a good game right some 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 great opportunities here and there for both clubs yeah and definitely even better when it comes to points being spread out to two different teams i think both corinthians and santos would be happy by taking a point in this game and Going back, as you said, uh, this is such a great rivalry. And one of my earliest memories as a child watching Santos is that 3-2 win against Corinthians in 2012. Such a great game and all top players scoring. I believe Romarinho was there for Corinthians as well at that time. So really wonderful to see. And talking about uh, Campeonato Paulista, uh, Corinthians had a 
bad start in the beginning, losing, uh, I believe, 1-0 to Red Bull Bragancino, but then had a really great run until they faced uh, Sao Bernardo. What do you think happened after that match on uh, February 2nd? They lost 2-0 against Sao Bernardo, then they tied against Portuguesa and Palmeiras. Uh, they came back and won a game against Mirasol, and then again tied to Santos. So hasn't really been going good so far, have they? Yeah, it's kind of a uh, hot and cold, right? Um, São Bernardo is a legitimately good team. Like, uh, they are on uh, the third division, I guess, but they are a good team. Like, they they have been uh, beating all the, the 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 greatest clubs in the in Campeonato Paulista, and um, it will be a, a huge challenge for Palmeiras on the quarterfinals. Um, but um, the reason for the the club being just this hot and cold, right? Just the um, they look like world beaters in one game, then look like absolute idiots in the pitch and another. Uh, I think it's when you see the table, um, it has to do with the place of the game, right? We were we are really good at home, really good at home. I don't know if it's uh, it's about the grass that is uh, probably the best in Brazil. I don't know if it's the fans, if it's everything together, if the club travels badly. I, I don't know. I just don't know. But um, it has to do with that. The 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 club has been having trouble playing away from home for a while now. For like uh, since since Silvino was here, like uh, we were just get the feed away, and then we got back home and, and looked like everything were was in control. Uh, Vitor Pereira didn't really fix it the last season and it still carries on. And um, it is a known problem. Uh, reporters ask Lazaro and the players this in um, the opportunities they get in interviews. And they're still trying to figure that out. And I hope they do. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting. And, and um, I know some people... Um, well, actually, you know, I'm curious to, to, to get your thoughts on here. Where do you, uh, you know, we had, like you said, Pete on from, um, uh, the glorious Botafogo Twitter account. Um, we were talking before, uh, we started recording. Um, he kind of made less of the, the Carioca state tournament. Um, curious how you see Campeonato Paulista, um, obviously as a lesser trophy, but, um, you know, do you do you still view it as important, or do you view it as more of a preseason? It is. It is now more of a preseason type of thing. It's it's like uh, it's good having bragging rights against your rivals, and that's all. Like mm-hmm. uh, when it gets to December, no one will really care if you won the state championship or not. And still, it's 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 nice. It has it's very history and. Uh, an interesting part about um, Brazilian football, like uh, it's a really big country and uh, the state championships really played a good part in capitalizing football among the, the small cities. And um, the the state championships are a good opportunity for us to, to watch the, the lesser teams, the smaller teams, to watch their players. And uh, sometimes, a lot often actually, um, some players who didn't have opportunity on the youth categories of big clubs just show up and uh, they start uh, having the, their opportunities, right? Like on top of my head, like I, I can think of Martinelli from from Arsenal, for example. Like um, he was from 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 the Corinthians um, youth squad, but it, um, he left for Ituano and he uh, he. He played the, the Campeonato Paulista for Ituano and he left directly for, for, for Arsenal. Like, for scouts, it's a, it's a good opportunity. There are a lot of good players out there. But at the same time, when you think about it, uh, the final, it happens in April. April, end of March, I don't know. But um, it's still a lot of time. It's still a lot of dates. Like, the champion plays uh, 16 games. Mm-hmm. The whole the whole Campeonato Paulista and it's it's a similar number on state championships, at least the the most popular ones uh, across Brazil. Um, it should be shortened, uh, even for for us to really enjoy it. You know, like uh, we we like to see our, our team playing, but at the same time we think, come on, man, it's we'll be playing like 
two months against the small clubs, you know, like uh, we want the big action, we want the 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 more history clashes, and um, that's why I think uh, from sixteen dates it should be shortened, like for eight or ten dates at most, mm. so it, it 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 doesn't feel like a drag for for fans and for players. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, I mean, in my opinion, I, I agree, and I think there needs to be some restructuring there. Um, but yeah, like you said, it is a great venue to see some of these young players. And like you said earlier, uh, Christian Barletta uh, from Sao Bernardo um, looks like a great player. 11 games, I think four goals and three assists. Um, and uh, I think he's probably going to be um, uh, a, a nice prospect for you guys. Um, so... Um, we're going to end off with uh, our famous predictions. Um, and we are going to ask you your prediction on um, where Corinthians are, are, are going to end up in um, these three competitions. And then also who you think is going to be um, the winner of this competition if it isn't Corinthians. So Paulista, of course, Brasil are out and Libertadores. Corinthians are in all three. They're probably, uh, they'll contest all three. Um, so what are your predictions for where they finish in those competitions and who eventually is going to win them, if not Corinthians? For Campeonato Paulista, I think we have enough to get to the finals. Like um, the contestants, like we always, think, we always think about the big clubs, right? So Bernardo is doing a great campaign, but at the same time, we want to, we want to face off against Santos, against São Paulo, against against Palmeiras, and um, I think Palmeiras is is a uh, is a bit further than us in the um, in squad uh, construction, and um, the coach has been there for almost two seasons now, so he got his way with the squad, and and everyone knows him and his style of play. So I think we can get to the finals of Campeonato Paulista, but but I am not really optimistic about winning it. We could. It's it's two games. It's a rivalry. Everything can happen. But um, thinking rationally, I think um, Palmeiras are ahead of us at this time. About Libertadores, um, last year was the first time since we won the title that we reached the the quarterfinals. Right, like uh, we lost on the on the initial playoffs in a year and then we we were knocked off in um the round of 16 like a bunch of times and um last year was really um this feat of of um beating Boca Juniors there and getting to the quarterfinals was something that that really uh bought Vitor Pereira some some trust last year and uh I think we can build up from there right I think um, thinking about anything less than a quarterfinal will be a step back. I think um, the club has everything to 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 reach at least the um, the semifinals, which um, I think it's a it's a it's a feasible goal. Um, win it all it's, it's a dream. Like um, we may get there, and uh, when we get there, it's a it's only one game, the final, it's a solo game. So uh, everything can happen. But uh, the, the feasible um, goal right now, I think, is to reach the, the semifinals. And about the Brasileirão, it's, it's, um, um, there are 38 games. Um, the problem is that you have to, um, you have to, um, Think about them um, as you were playing with Libertadores and as you were playing Copa do Brasil to rest your best players. Sometimes you, you can't feel the best players you get in Brasileirão, and that's a problem when you get a thin squad like, like we do. And um, so that's why I think we, we are probably behind Flamengo. Palmeiras, not so much. Palmeiras ha have uh, lost a lot of players, and uh, they are really relying on the. Um, on the tactical side of things right now, I think they are a really organized team, but at the same time, their bench is not that big anymore. So I think uh, Flamengo is, I think, the most safe bet. They will probably have fired Peter Pereira by now, 
<laughs> I think he 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 has too tough. He has a, a tough schedule. Uh, the fans are already mad at him, and uh, he has a game against Vasco and Botafogo. I think he won't survive, but I think uh, Flamengo will probably go go far with with their new coach. About Copa do Brasil, we we expect to win it. We really do. Uh, last year, the losing in the finals. Uh, left a sour taste in our mouth, and we want to to wash it away. You know, we the last time we won the Copa do Brasil was in two thousand nine. Uh, it's a long, long time, and we want to we want to win it. Awesome, great. Well, Fabian, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate. It. We didn't even get to comment. You know, I wanted to echo your comment and and Ernest's comment about how. I love the one of my favorite things, of course, is the is the crest of Corinthians. It's incredible. And just looking at it, you guys can't see it, but it's on his shirt. He's wearing the Ayrton Senna shirt as well, which is again a huge bragging right to say that Ayrton was 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 a fan of your club. So uh awesome to see. And once again, really thank you. Uh really appreciate it. Uh love interacting with you on Twitter and um Hopefully we will continue to do so and uh, um, hopefully we can get you back on and, and that uh, at Santos and Corinthians, we'll have some, some great battles uh, uh, coming up soon. Yeah, guys, I am um, honored to, 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 for you guys to have invited me here and um, thank you. Thank you for having me here. It was, it was great. It was great having this chat with you guys. Yeah, it was great. Thank you, Fabian. We had a chance to talk about, uh, as we do normally with every big club in Brazil and maybe in South America. So it was really a nice experience knowing more about the club's history and possible future that's coming in in a, really quick. Yeah. And Fabian, where can people find uh, find your stuff and find you online if they want to follow you and, and Corinthians in English or Portuguese? Um, on Twitter is at Corinthians underline underline en. So, so you guys can find me find me there. Uh, I'm tweeting things about Corinthians in in English and Portuguese. Nice, awesome. All right. Well, great. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for uh, listening. Hope you enjoyed it and have a great night.